You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, Working the Lord. Got uh, some kind of going on with my. I don't know if that's me. There, there you go. Welcome to Working the Lord. Jam's over here with you, and we're glad that you are with us tonight. Uh, there are other things you could be doing, other things you could be watching. We'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, we are glad that you are here with us, and we hope that you're ready for a study from God's Word. Our content information. If you'd like to reach me, a word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email, 276-340-2653. It's how you can reach me by phone, uh, text, uh, I don't know, carrier pigeon, if I knew what to look for, smoke signal, whatever. If you'd like a Bible study, if you would like a free copy of Muscle and Shovel, which I know Mark uh, just said that, uh, we're giving those away. It's a very good book. It's a, just a, a journey, a, a, a story about a man and his journey to find the truth. And I believe, friends, if you read this book, you probably will find yourself in his shoes. I believe there's a lot of people <coughs> who are uh, looking for the truth, and yet when they find the truth, they experience the same things this man does. And I think, but I think if you read that, and he goes through exactly what he studied and, and why he came to the conclusion they did, about the church that he was in, the denomination he was in, not being the truth, and why he came, became a member of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church, and because he found in the Bible. And I just think if you find that, read that book, you'll find that you are experiencing the very same thing. So we want to give you that book. It's called Muscle on the Shovel, and uh, we will certainly get one of those out to you. It's a nice book, uh, and so <clears throat> we would like to give that to you. Free of charge if you just uh, contact us and tell us you'd like uh, like one. Of course, you can uh, assemble with us uh, uh, 250 Boulevard on uh, Sundays at uh, 9 and 10 a.m. Thursday nights we have Bible study 7 p.m. So if you'd like to come out and visit with us, we hope that you will do that very thing. Take advantage of the times we have to study God's Word together. Now, I said earlier, <clears throat> I said there are some things that you could be doing or could be watching. And I can probably... Most of you are aware uh, that there's a uh, some sort of, sort of debate, I guess it must be kind of important, I don't know, that's going on tonight uh, on another channel somewhere on, on cable. <clears throat> but, you know, it's, it's a presidential debate. It's a uh, uh, Republican ca uh, candidate's presidential debate. Everybody's up in, in arms about it because one of the uh, participants, one of the candidates is not showing up. Um, Mr. Trump decided he wasn't going to come. He's mad about something. Somebody's mad about him, or he said something, she said something, whatever, and so he's taking his toys and going home. I don't know. I don't know how you feel about him. But I'm just saying there's a lot of people talking about why he won't debate. And I just want to show you that this is something that took place. Uh, I'm not going to play this video. I haven't listened to it all, so I don't really know how long it is or what it's going to say, but this is a... Uh, a video uh, that appeared on the news, and they're talking about in 2011, Mr. Trump was going to be a moderator for the Newsweek, uh, Newsmax debate, and uh, some of the participants weren't going to show up, and he said that it seems a little cowardly, or lack of courage, some of those effects. So when they didn't show up, he said it was lack of courage, and now he's not showing up for the debate. Well, I don't know if it's lack of courage. Maybe he's got a reason for doing it. I don't really care. My point is this, friends. We are always talking about debates. We are always talking about getting together, reasoning, putting two people on a platform, letting us mingle together ideas, let us understand what the Bible is saying, and come to a conclusion or come to our understanding about what the Bible says on a particular matter. And uh, when people don't participate, we have to wonder why? Now I want you to consider something. Is it really wrong to, dis to discuss the Bible, to have a, a debate? Friends, I submit to you that unity can be gained if we come to, a, to a, 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 the, the polemic platform, as they call it, the debating process. You know, Jesus prayed for unity in John 17, 20, 21. Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. 
And so unity is what Christ prayed for. And what we're going to find is if we will engage in the discussion of the Bibles, we will realize or something can be revealed that may very well help us understand what the word from the Lord really is. Now listen, um, when you start having discussions, Bible discussions, whether you're sitting down uh, across the kitchen table, opening up your Bible, or when you are maybe listening to what your preacher said and you go back and you go look up some scriptures that, well, they probably, he probably didn't give you any scriptures, but if you start looking at scriptures, you might find, well, you know what he said is not true. But when you start having discussions about what people say or what they believe, and they start putting everything out on the table, you say, well, wait a minute, something's amiss here. Things start to be revealed when you have a discussion with differing doctrines. Now, just take, for example, listen to this discussion between uh, Johnny Robertson and Brian Edwards. Uh, there are three things that I want to establish, first of all, tonight, um, just to help you, the viewer, understand why I'm here. First of all, I just want to be clear that I'm not here tonight to argue with Johnny Robertson. As a matter of fact, I believe wholeheartedly that uh, arguing is detrimental to the cause of Christ. Um, Johnny often references that people in the Word of God debated. I never found anywhere where someone was saved during one of those debates, but rather they were saved by the preaching of the Word of God. Well, all right. So, so Brian says, well, no one was saved during the end of those debates. Well, maybe not during, but right after, there was a whole lot of people who obeyed the gospel as a result of the debate, as a result of the mingling together. And so when we think that if someone doesn't want to have a discussion, if they don't want to talk about the Bible, if they don't want to tell us what they believe or they don't want to hear what someone else believes uh, on what the Bible says, then it makes me think, well, maybe they've got something to hide. If they don't think debating is productive, then maybe there's something amiss that, that they're not real sure about, they're not real confident about, and so they don't want to have a discussion unless the the errors or fallacies or something about what they believe be exposed. And so, you know, we don't seem to have a problem with debates when it comes to politics. I mean, I don't know how many debates they've, they've had between the, the, the two parties, Republicans and the Democrats. I don't know how many they've had, but, man, they've had a whole bunch of them. And no one seems to have a problem watching them. I mean, 24 million, 40 million, I don't know how many people watch these debates. Why? Must, if there's something so wrong about debating, well, someone says, well, it's not debating. That's wrong. It's just debating the scriptures, debating the Bible. Friends, do you realize what you're saying? See, when people, when people don't know what they believe, when they only listen to what their preacher says, then they, then they really don't have a faith that's based upon the Bible. And, but what debate does, debate actually brings out the, uh, uh, the, the error of what people believe. Now, listen, here's a good example of why we need to have a debate. This is why we need to have discussions about what the Bible is teaching. Because so many people are teaching different things, but yet no one seems to want to talk about it. Here's a call from just a couple weeks ago. Listen to what this man says. There's the visible sign of visible change. You're on the word from the Lord. My pastor, Freedom Baptist Church, do not prove y'all be a liar, and y'all ain't preaching the truth. And you go down there and get saved, let him save you. Who is that? Who's, who's your preacher? Freedom Baptist Church. He'll save you people. Freedom don't, Baptist don't, Church? Who's don't your prophet? Who's, who's the preacher? Who's the preacher? All right, drive by caller. Calls in, fires a shot, hangs up. Run. All right, now friends, this is what we're talking about. Here's a man that says, my preacher done proved y'all to be liars. Really? I don't know who his preacher is. How is it that a man has proven me to be a liar and he hadn't even talked to me? How does he know for sure what I believe? Is it that? And why is it that the man is talking about what I believe or what I teach and he hasn't tried to save me. Now, this man said, go down there and he'll save you. Well, I don't even know where to go. I mean, how many Freedom Baptist churches are there in this area? I know there's at least three that I know of. And so my point is, here are people who say, well, you're wrong, but we don't want to discuss why you're wrong. Really? Do you, really, do you not love my soul? 
You really don't love me enough to help me find out or show me where I'm wrong? You know what? A debate would really help that. A debate would really help that discussion. Notice this. In Acts 17, verses 2 through 4, now this might have been what uh, Mr. Brian Edwards was referring to, but notice it's in Acts 17, 2 through 4, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath day reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. <clears throat> uh, and some of them believed. Now, wait a minute. I thought that no one was saved in these debates. Paul went in for three Sabbaths day, opening and alleging and reasoning with them from the Scripture, and some of them believed. Well, who was it that believed? Um, and devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of, tw and of the chief women, not a few. I've never heard of anybody being saved as a result of debate. Well, there it is, right there, Acts 17, 2 through 4, opening and legending and reasoning from the Scriptures. Now, who was, he, who was he reasoning with? Who was he opening and alleging to? Well, it had to be Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, but yet notice what the text says. Their reasoning and opening and alleging that Jesus must have need suffered, risen again from the dead, uh, uh, risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He wasn't preaching. He was proving or defending what he preached. And the result was people obeyed. They believed. Now, if you just stop there, I mean, there ought to be, there shouldn't be a, there ought to be a line of Baptists out here to debate because debate causes people to believe. They believe that's all there is to being saved. Well, what better way to get people to just believe and believe only than to have a debate? But yet, stand, there's plenty of room out there, you know, you know, two chairs, no waiting, like old Floyd's Barbershop, you know. There, 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 there's no waiting to, if you want to have a debate. So here's what we're talking about, friends. Unity requires discussing these differences. If we're going to get along. Now, the New Testament church grew, and it was unified because they engaged in these discussions. They engaged in these important matters. They were discussing their differences, and that's why they grew. Now, notice this. Let's look at the dissension and disputation. See, there are some differences, but when you have disputation, you, you come together in agreement. All right? Now notice this. In Acts 15, Acts 15, um, verses 1 and 2, let's see where we can get our Bible up here where we might be reading this a little bit better. Here we go, Acts 15. Uh, verses 1 and 2, and, a certain, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, <clears throat> well, that was not very Christian-like, was it? Paul and Barnabas, y'all went in there and y'all had broke, just busted up the place. Y'all were arguing, had some dissension, you know, we just all, all need to get along. You know what, friends? Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, whatever, they, they don't get along. Not really. They, they say they do. There's dissension among them. It's just that they won't discuss, they won't have a disputation about their differences. But here it is, dissension and disputation. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and a certain of the others should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question. Notice verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through uh, Phoenicia, Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and caused great joy unto them that heard this. Now notice verse 4. <clears throat> and as they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and the apostles and elders and declared to them all things that God had done. So here they're coming. They're coming down to Jerusalem and they're going to discuss this matter that's caused all this dissension and they're going to give us some disputation. They're going to have a, have a get-together. Now, here's the problem. Some people were thinking and teaching that it was a command to obey the law of Moses. That is, that it was a command that you had to 
be circumcised. In Acts 15, verse 5, Acts 15, verse 5, look at this. Here's, here's the problem that we're having here. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Now here's the problem. They said it was needful and that it was a command that had to be taught. Now here's the problem. See, friends, the reason why people are having the problems they did in Acts 15 is because they were saying God commanded one thing and somebody else saying, no, God didn't command it. God wants one thing. The other group saying, no, God doesn't want that. Well, if you say God wants something and I say God doesn't want something, we need to have a discussion about it to see what it is God really wants. God has already made up his mind what he wants. We have to come to a conclusion about what it is he actually does want. All right? So what had God commanded about salvation for the Gentiles? That's, that was the, that's the answer, or that's the, uh, uh, the question to be discussed here. What is it that God has commanded about salvation concerning what someone must do to be saved that was what needed to be discussed. Well, you know what? We, we can have that same discussion today. And what you do when you want to find out, well, what is it that God requires in a certain situation? Well, why don't you go back and consult? Ask the individuals who were there. Look at this. In Acts 15 and verse 7, if they had a discussion about what God wanted from the Gentiles, all they had to do is ask the first preacher, the first apostle, that went to the Gentiles, and that is, that, that would be uh, Peter. Look at this in, in Acts 15, verse 7. Now, when there had been much disputing, boy, it was going back and forth. God wants this. No, he don't. Yeah, he does. No, he don't. I'm a gonna, and I ain't gonna. Whatever. You know, they're back and forth. You know, it's like the family get together at Thanksgiving. Boy, they just all back and forth. Here it is. Peter stands up and says, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice uh, among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. All right? And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, Peter is going to tell the Gentiles Peter's going to tell the Gentiles only what God required of them. Now, wouldn't you expect that? Wouldn't you expect Peter to only tell them what God wanted them to know? And that's exactly what he did. Peter was going to tell them what? What was Peter going to tell them? Now, if there's something about circumcision in what God commanded, Peter would know. So let's find out what did God tell Peter about salvation concerning the Gentiles. Well, here's Cornelius in Acts 10.33. He's the man that, that uh, Peter went to see. In Acts 10.33, uh, if you read Acts 10, and many therefore I send to thee, this is Cornelius talking to Peter, he said, I send for you, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Don't leave out a thing, Peter. We want to hear everything God told you to tell us about what we must do to be saved. We, we want to hear it. Now, Peter, Peter in Acts 11 and verses 13 and 14, he gets back to Jerusalem and he's recounting everything that happened with Cornelius. And notice what he says. And he showed us how that he had seen an angel in the house. Talk about Cornelius. Cornelius told us how he saw an angel in his house, which stood and said, send men to Joppa, Call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thou house shall be saved. So Peter will tell him words. Everything that God commanded is what Peter was going to tell him. Now, you know what, friends? When you look at what Peter told Cornelius, Peter told them what God told Peter to tell them. Now, when you read through Acts 10, and you read through Acts 11, you know what you will not find? 
you will not find anything about Cornelius needing to obey Moses. You won't find anything about, well, you need to obey the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to go back and go uh, live under the Old Testament. You didn't hear a word about that. So you know what the conclusion is? They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to obey the law of Moses. Now, we need to have that same discussion today. You know why? Because there's a lot of people saying, well, let's still go back to the Old Testament. It's still binding. Let's go back to the Old Testament and get our authority. You didn't hear God say anything about that. You didn't hear God say anything about going back to the law of Moses concerning your salvation today. Now, that was the discussion that they had in Acts 15, or excuse me, in Acts 10 and verse 11. And they were having again in Acts 15. What did God require the Gent uh, of the Gentiles? Well, he didn't say anything about circumcision. He didn't say anything about going back to the law of Moses. So, should we be doing that today? See how we could have a discussion? A discussion brings out what God said and what God wants as opposed to what men think God said and what men think God wants. Now, someone says, well, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that is right. I think that there may be something Peter left out. Peter forgot. Well, just listen to Paul and Barnabas then. Because Peter told them what God told Peter to tell them. Now, if that's not convincing enough, look at this. In Acts 15 and verse 12. Acts 15 and verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Okay, Peter had his say. Barnabas and Paul, you get your say. Now, you know what? We have some folks today that say that Peter and Paul are we're teaching different doctrines, that they're teaching different gospels. Well, you know what? It'd be a good discussion to sit down and let's see if Peter and Paul really taught something different. Peter and uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas sat down and they declared what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James said, wait a minute. Paul and Barnabas? Paul and Barnabas uh, were telling what they did. That's exactly right. Now, I want you to go back and find where God commanded Paul to command the people to obey Moses before they obeyed the gospel. You know what? You won't find it. You won't find it. You'll actually find just the opposite. You'll find where Paul is teaching people that it's not essential to be circumcised. It's not essential to go back and obey the law of Moses. So Peter and Paul are actually agreement on this. And the result came from having a discussion. People saying, oh, God wants this. And Paul and Peter are both saying, no, God doesn't want this. Now, if you're not satisfied with Peter, the apostle, saying God didn't command something that men thought should be uh, bound, and you're not, you're not convinced by Paul, the apostle, saying it, well, how about we just do this? How about we get one more apostle in here? How about we get one more apostle? Because notice this. Here's what James says. Here's what James says. Acts chapter 15, <coughs> verse 13. After they had their peace, James answering, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God the first did visit the Gentiles. All right. Well, he says, Peter, Peter did his talking. He says to uh, take out of them a people for his name. And to this agreed the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who, do, who doeth all these things, known unto God, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, now look, this is the key word right here. Wherefore my sentence is this. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. You know what James just said? James just said, I'm judging something here. Huh? <laughs> James, you judge? That's exactly right. My sentence. Friends, that's the same word 
that you find in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 3 where Paul, talking to the Corinthians about a fornicator that was in their midst, Paul was not even there. He'd heard about it. And this is what he says. He says, For verily is absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done this deed. He said, I've judged it. And my judgment is this. It's what James says. James says, I'm judging this. I'm making a pronouncement. I'm coming to a conclusion. This is what we are going to say. My judgment is this. We don't bind the old law on these Gentiles. Peter didn't do it. Paul didn't do it. James didn't do it. And so they have now come to a conclusion that it's not something that needs to be done. As a matter of fact, it is counterproductive. It is a sin, actually, to do it. Notice this. He says, That would trouble them not, which from the Gentiles are turned to God, for as much as we have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. How are they subverting their souls? Saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we, who's we? The apostles, Peter, Paul, and James, and the others, <clears throat> the apostolic authority did not sanction the circumcising of people in order to be saved. He says, we gave no such commandments. The apostles are the ones who were in the seat of authority. And Peter said, no circumcision, no law of Moses. Paul said, no circumcision, no law of Moses. James said, no circumcision, no law of Moses. And it all came about because they came together to discuss it. Now, friends, let me tell you something. If folks needed to get together to have a Bible discussion about what God wants and what God doesn't want, in the days when the apostles walked on the face of the earth, and in the days when the apostles would come down and join in the discussion, don't you think that surely you and I need to sit down and have a Bible discussion, a debate, a disputation about what God wants today? I mean, they had apostles there. And they still had to have this discussion. And you and I, we don't have apostles. We have their words. We have the inspired word of God. So if apostles need to get together and join into a discussion to find out what God said, surely you and I need to do the same thing. Surely we, we would need to do the same thing. See that? And so notice this. They only bound what was necessary on the people. In Acts 15, verse 50, uh, 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That's what James says. Friends, God never gave a commandment for circumcision to be bound on individuals in the New Testament in order to be saved. Never said it. Never said it. Never said. God never commanded people to obey Moses in order to obey the gospel. Never said it. Now, we need to have that discussion because there's a lot of... Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt, if you would. Because there's a lot of people who think that, yeah, we, we still bound in the old law. We're still bound. We still, we still need to go back and get our tithes and our instrumental music and everything else on it. We, we need to have that discussion. Because it really comes down to authority. What does God want? What does God command? As opposed to what do men think God commands? And again, if the apostles need to come together to have a Bible study, surely you and I do. Certainly today it would be <clears throat> uh, necessary or essential, beneficial, for us to get together and find out what God says. Because there are some things that people talk about as being necessary that, you know what? If you study your Bible, we have a discussion about it. We may find out, you know what? That's not necessary. Or it may be you think, well, that's not necessary. And yet when we get through discussing our Bible, we say, well, you know what? That is necessary. That is essential. 
See, they came together to discuss matters of salvation and what was necessary for someone to be saved. Now, can we do the same thing? Can we discuss salvation? Can we discuss things that accompany salvation? Things that are connected to our salvation just like they did in Acts 15, verses 1 and verse 5? Remember that? <clears throat> Acts 15, verses uh, 1 and 5. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, saying that it is... Uh, uh, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, now, I don't know that anybody's teaching that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. But I know there's some folks that are teaching that there are some things that are essential that are not. And some folks are teaching that some things aren't essential that I know they are. But the only way we're going to come to a unity, have unity, the only way we'll come to agreement is if we, if we have a, a discussion on these matters. So what are some necessary things to that? What are some necessary things? What about this? What about, <clears throat> is it necessary to be baptized for the remission of sins? Can we, can we dispute and discuss this matter? Is baptism really essential is it really necessary for the remission of sins? See, some people are going to say no. For example, Tim White, Baptist preacher, listen to what he says. I say this evening that you called me and you said, hey, preacher Whitehart, I want to go to heaven. What do I have to do? And I said, well, you have to be baptized for the remission of sin. And you said to me, well, can you baptize me this evening? And I said to you, well, I'm kind of tied up tonight, but I'll tell you what I can do. Because, you know, human beings get tied up with this. i tell you what I'll do. I'll meet you tomorrow. Now, friends, do you, do you think that's really what a gospel preacher would say? I'll meet you tomorrow. Can you imagine that? this evening that you this called me and you said, hey, preacher Whitehart, I want to go to heaven. What do I have to do? And I said, well, you have to be baptized for the remission of sin. And you said to me, well, can you baptize me this evening? And I said to you, well, I'm kind of tied up tonight, but I'll tell you what I can do. Because, you know, human beings get tied up with this. I tell you what I'll do. I'll meet you tomorrow. I'll meet you tomorrow. Well, friends, what if someone said, "Well, preacher Whitehart, what must I do to be saved?" Well, you need to repent. Well, I'm kind of tied up right now, preacher Whitehart. I don't really want to repent right now. You know, I'm right in the middle of a of of a good sin, boy. I'm down here at the bar getting drunk. I, I'm having a good old time. I don't want to repent right now. What about I do it tomorrow? I'm kind of tied up right now. You think he'd say okay? See how silly that is, friends. Listen, if the Bible says that a person must be baptized for the remission of sins to be saved, and someone asks me that, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, Peter told them, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, if someone called up and asked me that, and I told them that, and they said, well, can you baptize me for the remission of sins tonight? I can tell you there's a number of things that I will tell them, but there's one thing I won't tell them. And it won't be, well, I'm kind of tied up right now. You know what? There was, a, there was an occasion. I'll tell you, this is a true story. A man called me one day, and he said he wanted to be baptized. So I was talking to him. I said, well, who are you? He said, well, I'm in Danville. Well, I was in Burlington. 
I said, you know what, sir? I said, you don't have to have me to baptize you. I said, but let me call a faithful Christian and put you in touch with him and he'll baptize you. And if, and if I can't get a hold of him, I'll be up there just as quick as I can. I mean, I'm on my way. You know where I was going? I was, I was in a Bible study. I was going to go into a Bible study. Now, if you don't believe that, the brother's probably listening and watching. He obeyed the gospel. That man obeyed the gospel. He's a member of the church in Danville, Virginia right now. You see, I, I, may, be, I may be a thousand miles away, but I'll tell you this. I'll find someone I'll find someone who will baptize you and help you obey the gospel if I can't get there and do it. I can tell you another story about a man in, uh, in Kentucky, same way. Been watching our programs on TV. He said, I need to obey the gospel. I said, let me find somebody. Let me call somebody. And that man's a faithful member of the church today too. I'm not about to put someone off. Matter of fact, that happened after a TV program. I was at home. I was in bed. It was midnight when the man called me. Now, friends, I'm saying to you, you know what? That's the difference between a gospel preacher and a Baptist preacher. A Baptist preacher said, well, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm kind of tied up, you know. Yeah, he, he probably was tied up. He playing on with the trombone player, I think, or... Somebody, piccolo player, flute player. He might have literally been tied up. I don't know. But you see, friends, the only way we know for sure what the Bible is going to say on this matter is if we had a discussion. Is it really necessary? Is it really essential? Can we get together and find these things out? See? But you see, so many people try to get around God's command. Instead of just having a discussion and saying, yes, this is what God says, or no, this is not what God says, you know what they try to do? They actually don't deny that it's what it says. Now follow me on this. You have preachers that they don't deny <clears throat> that the Bible says that a person must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Mark 16, look at this, Mark 16 15 and 16. Look at this. He said unto them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, they really have to be really dishonest to say that's not what Jesus says. So what do they do? You know what they do? They try to make the command not apply, uh, applicable today. Look at this. Listen to what this, uh, this preacher says, all right? Listen to what he says. Uh, I'm going to get over here and get my Bible off the screen. My monitor over here is not working. Listen to what he says about Mark 16. All right, the commands to be baptized. Hey, Johnny, was, was Mark, was the Gospel of Mark, was that New Testament? Here we go, hold on. You're on what's about, I'm saying. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, question here goes to Brother Brian there. Yes. I, uh, I've got my Bible looking at it. Uh, it's uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And it does say that uh, you have to, verse 16 says, He that believe and is baptized shall be saved. So I won't agree with uh, Brother Brian on what he's talking hey, about. Hey, uh, sir, can I, can I make one statement? Yes, sir. Number one, Mark chapter 16, that's a great reference, but that's pre-first century church. But that's pre-first century church. But that's pre-first century church. Now, you hear that, folks? Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, it, it does say it. It's a great reference, but you know what? That's, that's before... That's before the first century church. Well, hello, McFly. When Jesus was on the earth and he was teaching, he was preparing for the church to come. It was all pre-New Testament church. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all took place all before the New Testament church. So we're going to throw everything out? You know what? We've got to throw John 3.16 out. That's before the New Testament church. See how silly that is? So it's not like they're denying that baptism is for the remission of sins and that Jesus said it's for the remission of sins. They want to say, well, that's before the New Testament church. That just, you know, okay, but we're going to move it back here before the New Testament church. Well, everything, everything that you uh, quote from John, you know, that's all New Testament church before pre-New Testament church too. John 3, 16, Jesus hadn't even died on the cross yet. he just gotten going. Now, are we going to say that's pre-New Testament church too, so we can't use that one? See, why is it they work so hard to get around the commands to be, the, to be baptized? Like saying, well, that's pre-New Testament church. Why don't you just obey it? See what they're doing? They're contrary, that's contrary to what three apostles stated, or contrary to what three apostles stated, that's Peter, James, and John, Peter, Paul, and James, excuse me, contrary to what three apostles stated, the Jews wanted to bind on men what God had not bound. That is, they wanted to say you had to be circumcised. Now look what happens today. Today, contrary to what 13 apostles stated, that's Peter and the 11, and then Paul, the denominations want to loose from men what God has bound on them as a command, and that is to be baptized for the remission of sins. Do you follow me on that? In Acts 15, the Jews came up and said, well, we, we, we're going to say you've got you to be circumcised. Paul, Peter, John says, nope, God didn't bind that. That is not what God commanded. Today, you have people saying, well, you don't have to be baptized. God did not command to be baptized for the mission of sins. Well, I've got Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Bartholomew, James the Less, Simon, Thaddeus, Paul, they all said, yeah, he did. Yeah, baptism is for the mission of sins. Now, why is it that so many people disagree on that? Why don't we get together, let's look at all the scriptures on what God has said. Why don't we get all the information from God and from his, from his uh, apostles and inspired men and come to a conclusion, an honest <coughs> conclusion about what God really wants? Can't we do that? See the benefit of debate? It really and truly helped. It really and truly helped this situation. It would help today too. And you wouldn't have all this foolishness going around like saying, well, I'm kind of tied up, so I can't baptize you. Or, well, that's pre-New that's pre Testament church. Well, if we discuss the necessary things, we put a little dispute and discussion into them, we'll find out whether it's true or not. How about this? Can we discuss whether the church is important? Is the church important? Is it necessary? Some people are saying it is. Some people say it's not. Johnny proved my point when he said you don't have to be in the Baptist church to be in Christ. He's absolutely right. The important thing is that you be in Christ. You don't have to be in the Baptist church to be in Christ. You don't have to be in the Baptist church to be in Christ. You don't have to be in the Baptist church to be in Christ. You don't have to be in the Baptist church to be in Christ. Well, no doubt about it, friends, I want to be in Christ. But I don't have to be in the Baptist church. Okay? All right? Church is not important. But Baptist church anyway is not important. That's one Baptist preacher. In the church, I'm saved. But see, I don't want to be in the church. I want to be in Christ. Well, if, if I'm in the church, I'm in Christ. Romans 12, verse 4 and 5. But see, I don't want to be in the church. I want to be in Christ. Well, but see, I don't want to be in the church. I want to be in Christ. Well, 
All right, here's another Baptist preacher. I don't want to be in the church. I want to be in Christ. Church is not important. Church is not important. I could play you another one. I could play you, I could play you Presbyterian saying the same thing. The church, being in the, Presby, in the, in the uh, uh, Presbyterian church is not important. You have to be in the church that Christ built. Well, what does that tell you about the Presbyterian church then? You don't have to be in the Presbyterian church to be saved, but you do have to be in the church that Christ built to be saved. Therefore, the Presbyterian church is not the church that Christ built, and therefore, it's not the church of Christ. It's not, it's not essential. Baptist, Presbyterian, everybody, everybody that you talk to says, oh, no, the church not, you don't have to be in the church to be saved. Ask them. Ask your preacher friend. Friends, ask your preacher, do I have to be in the Baptist church to be saved? Do I have to be in the Methodist church to be saved? Do I have to be a member of this church to be saved? <clears throat> now, I'm not talking about that particular uh, a congregation or group of people. I'm talking about that denomination. Do you have to be a Presbyterian to be saved? Do you have to be a Methodist to get to heaven? Do you have to be a Lutheran to get to heaven? If you want to enter heaven and spend eternity with God, do I have to be? Do I, do I have to be? in the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Ask them. And they're going to say no. And they're going to say no. And if they say yes, I'd sure like to know that too. Because then I have another question that we need to discuss. But here's what I find very interesting. Well, first of all, listen, here's necessary. It, can you be in Christ and not in the church? Friends, can you really be in Christ and not in the church? In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and, and the mother of Mary and James, sorry about that, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, He had put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. Now, can you be in, in Christ, can you be in Christ, in his body, and not be in the church? Well, I don't think you can. But the two people that we just listened to, and the countless others that believe the church is not important, will tell you, yes, you can. I'd like to know how. Maybe that's something we could discuss. How can you be in Christ and not be in the church? Why? Because the church is the body of Christ. Romans 12 and verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ. One body is in Christ. See that? We need to have a discussion. How is it you can be in the church and not in Christ? I, I don't think you can separate the two. But maybe I'm missing something, friends. Maybe we need to have that discussion. Maybe the man that uh, from the Freedom Baptist Church, maybe he'll call in and... Uh, tell us who his preacher is or tell his preacher to call in and we'll have that discussion. See? But here's what I'm saying, friends. If I couldn't find the church that I was in in the Bible, if I, if I was in a Baptist church and I couldn't find the Bible, if I was in a Methodist church, a Lutheran church, the Presbyterian church, the Pentecostal the Holiness church, the, the Latter, Church of the Latter-day Saints, if I couldn't find any of these churches in the Bible, you know what I'd say? I'd say it wasn't important either. God didn't think it was very important. He didn't even talk about it. Now, can we discuss why it is you're in a church that's not important enough to be in, that's not important enough for God to talk about? Maybe we need to have that discussion. So, friends, I'm trying to get you to think. I'm trying to get you to reason and just, you know, <clears throat> get the old cobwebs out. Let's think a little bit. Why are you in a church not in the Bible? Why are you in a church that your preacher says is not even important? But here's what I find very interesting. They all say the church is not important. Oh, no, no, you don't have to be in a church to be safe. Um, you know, the church, just be in Christ. You just got to be in Christ. But you know what? It really must be important to them because you know why? They all want to be like the New Testament church. <laughs> and look at this. Here's a Baptist preacher. Here's a Baptist preacher. Two Baptist preachers said the church is not important. You just got to be in Christ. Church is not important. Church is not important. Listen to what he says. 
believe that the independent fundamental Baptist church today is the closest thing that I can find to that New Testament church. I believe that the independent fundamental Baptist church today is the closest thing that I can find to that New Testament church. All right. The, the independent fundamental Baptist church is the closest he could find to the New Testament church. Why is it even important? Why are you even trying to get close? It's not important. By the way, I call it the fundamental independent Baptist church. The FIB church, the FIB church. Got to be a fib, right? It's not true. Fundamental Independent Baptist Church is the closest he's found. Well, why are you even concerned about how close it is? Uh, the uh, uh, independent means that a church patterns itself after the New Testament example and that it stands alone under the authority uh, of the I'm Bible. I'm convinced that for, uh, in this day and time <coughs> that the, uh, the, the autonomy of the local church, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church is the closest that I can find, James, that uh, uh, meets my needs. I believe that the independent fundamental Baptist church today is the closest thing that I can find to that New Testament church. Now the name independent fundamental uh, Baptist church is traditionally used by uh, churches that pattern themselves after the example of the early church. All right, here, so here Mitchell Linderman is saying the, the independent fundamental Baptist church pattern themselves after the New Testament church Close as he's found to the New Testament church, but yet it's not very close because he can't show it in the Bible. And by the way, Mr. Linderman is one of these guys that came on, that came on and said he'd come back, but never did. Here's one more from him. We can get this to play. Uh, he's going to give us a little history lesson, I guess. But again, friends, if it's not important, why are you concerned about how close you are to the original? Uh, well, what about what about some other uh, ways that the, that uh, you're going that you want to say the Baptist Church is identical to the Church of the New Testament? Okay, uh, Benedict in the history of the Baptist states that the gospel was preached in Britain within 60 years of the Lord's return to heaven. I don't find that he preached Church of Christ. I don't find that they named it anything else other than just the Baptist church. These churches appear to have been Baptistic and remained sound until Austin, the Catholic monk, brought Catholicism to the Isles in 597 Now, what, what does it say? They were, they were named Baptist churches? Benedict, in the history of the Baptist, states that the gospel was preached in Britain as Baptist. That was the first recorded Baptist church in history. Okay, but I'm saying if I go back to the Bible? You're back, back beyond my 60 years. That's no, right. That's number 40. All right. Okay. So, so why not go back those 60 years? Why not go back those 60 years? Well, because you can't find it. Now, I don't believe you can find the Baptist church 60 years after the gospel was preached. But even if you could, friends, even if you could, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, when the church began, you won't find it being called the Baptist church. You won't find it being talked about in the New Testament about the Baptist church. So why not get back all the way to the beginning if it's so important? If it's not important, why go back and try to be just like it? And if it is important, why not find it in the Bible? See, friends, we need to have this discussion. But no one wants to talk about it because they're afraid that, well, if we get to talking about it, you know what? We'll be exposed. We'll, we'll, we'll show some, we'll be, uh, some flaws will be shown. Some errors will be shown. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be proven to be wrong. Friends, I'm going to tell you, we love you with all our hearts. And that's why we're trying to get you to think about what the Bible is saying versus what man is saying versus what you've been told all your life. Let's, let's reason together if it's really true or not. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. <clears throat> Here's one more. Here's one more I want to show you. Listen, friends, these folks will tell you the church doesn't matter. But I'm going to show you why I say they believe it. Listen to what Mr. Jackie Poe says, Mercy Cross and Church of God. Listen to what he says about the Methodist Church versus the Church of God. I remember when he accepted me. I remember, I remember some of you forgotten. And some of the good church members there at the Cliffview Church of God tried to clean me up a little bit. 
I have a little trouble understanding some of that. Some of them go to the altar and some of them shake me and put their hand under my mouth and do that. I thought, what in the world's going on here? I was just an old Methodist boy who got saved. I love the Methodist church, by the way. Still do love that church. It's just an old Methodist boy who got saved. It's just an old Methodist boy who got saved. It's just an old Methodist boy who got saved. I love the Methodist church, by the way. You can't get saved in a Methodist church, apparently, according to Jackie Poe. Now, apparently he's, he knows that church is important. At least he's going to say the Methodist church is not important because he couldn't be saved in it. Love the Methodist, by the way. Well, do you love them enough to tell them that they're wrong? Do you love them enough to tell them that, you know what, if you're in the Methodist church, you can't be saved? That's really what he believes. See, friends, they won't really say what they really believe. They really believe that they're the only ones going to heaven too. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in all these different. They wouldn't be in the church they're in. Now, friends, how much we care for you is we're going to tell you the truth, and we want to have some Bible discussions with you, help you see what the will of God really is. Friends, I hope you can see that we're trying to help you see the necessary things for salvation, and the debate and discussion is a good thing. Thanks for watching. If you need contact me, two seven six three four zero two six five three. Until then, always remember to ask what does the Bible say, and you get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. But apparently you don't know truth. Because if you knew truth, you wouldn't teach your people, watch it, that they're under law of Moses with tithe and mechanical instruments of music. Now you're bringing the tithing over and the instrumental music over. But what about the burnt offering? I hear the music, but I don't smell no beat. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? In these churches, they got, in your church, every one of them, they got mechanical music, they teach tithing, right? I don't smell no beef. Where's the beef? You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the music. You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the tithe. Why didn't you bring in the, the beef? Where's the beef? All the congregation worship. So they were worshiping on the law of and had singers sing, trumpets sound, and all of this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Ask your pastor, some of you people are watching this television program, ask your pastor. Hey, where's the beat? I don't think there's anybody back there.